Uh, welcome to this um, 2016 highlight video. I think uh, what we will be uh, looking at is a number of quite important pieces of information, research and scientific information uh, provided by investigators from all over the world. So the right drug for the right patient, for probably at the right time, at the right dose, and nowadays at the right price. We are trying to move from treating the disease to treating the patient, not only for taking into account uh, efficacy, but also taking into account safety issues. We would like to identify that patient who is going to respond to that drug and also that patient who probably will have a number of side effects with that specific drug. Personalized medicine is a medical approach that separates patients into different groups with medical decisions, practices, interventions, and their products being tailored to the individual patient. It is based on their predicted response or risk of disease. This is uh, uh, the treatment decision making process is so complex that this is what we do in our center. Uh, we, we organize at least one uh, clinical session, normally two or three. It's a multidisciplinary or multi center session by video conference. We will link with other hospitals within the region. Uh, the neuroradiology, I think Alec Rovira is hidden here, but this is, is there. And then we decide, we present the case and we decide the best treatment for that patient. particular I found uh, most useful uh, studies uh, aimed at identifying MS prediction models for poor outcome and treatment uh, uh, response failure and at evaluating uh, comparative and long-term effectiveness of DMTs in current use for multiple sclerosis or for future new drugs. Uh, of course the results of these studies uh, will uh, allow physicians uh, to meet the promise of uh, personalized medicine for MS patients. The take-home messages for me are first the importance of collecting data in real uh, practice, in daily practice, uh, to uh, provide good, good quality real-life evidence so we can answer question that cannot be answered by the industrial and by clinical trials. This is the, the really first uh, uh, important message. The second important message would be uh, the result of the KRMS uh, one trial in the long term, which is very impressive. And uh, the message is we probably can change the life of our patient with those kind of treatments if we use it. Uh, very early uh, and then we, ha we have to balance that with the, the, the risks, with the, 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 the side effects that seems to not to be so important in those, uh, those patients. whichever school they come from, is to start to think a little bit differently about trial design. Could they do more than one thing with their trial? Could they look at more than one drug, more than one technique, and do two or three? And then you have run two or three trials in one. So just to start to get people thinking that there are different ways to skin a cat, as they say, there are, there are more than the classical ways of doing trial designs. One can think about the multi-arm platforms, 
different sort of statistical schools like Bayesian, using registries to embed trials within those. Um, there's quite a, a range. The key, the key is to start with an idea and find a very good statistician to help you make the plans for your trial. If I have to take a message from this uh, session, uh, I have to say that from one side in the session, we have seen that there are new strategies in terms of trial designs and outcomes to follow the patients. We have new evidences of, uh, about the pathophysiology of the damage, this uh, destruction of the spines in the spinal cord is extremely interesting. And then we have also some initial evidence that we may support the individualized treatment with a new tool that is looking at the spinal cord and the, at the molecular findings at the level. And finally, that we have another potential small window open for treatment with the lipoic acid story. It was really an honor uh, to be able to give this first lecture in honor of Christian Confreveau. He has, had really done so much for the field of MS in terms of doing basic observations in the way patients behave across the course of their disease, and then try to relate that to what might be underlying emotive forces. He recognized that patients early on uh, are characterized primarily by attacks, although not all patients. And that at some point, and it usually seem to be more correlated with age or duration of disease, both of which go quite together, start having less and less of that activity, and now we start seeing a more uh, unrelenting progressive accumulation of disability. That's led to the hypothesis that there may be two stages of the pathogenesis of this disease. And it's a very critical thing for us to be understanding uh, because it may lead to different therapeutic avenues for uh, transforming further the course of the disease in a beneficial way for our patients. In the late breaking news session, a uh, number of studies highlighted new therapeutic uh, possibilities in MS. One of them is cipinamod, which is an immunomodulator that seems to have uh, a trend of efficacy in secondary progressive disease. In addition, uh, another study with fampiridine, which is a symptomatic therapy for MS, was presented, but the difference now is that this is long acting and the outcome used are uh, more sophisticated than before and again uh, showed efficacy using upper extremity function and ambulation. And thirdly, uh, a presentation on fluoxetine, which is believed to have neuroprotective effect, unfortunately was not statistically significant, but does not rule out the possibility that uh, either this drug or similar drugs uh, could benefit a subset of patients with uh, uh, MS. And lastly, uh, we're all interested in biomarkers of disease activity in MS, and one of the presentations showed that a, uh, a compound, uh, a protein uh, called neurofilament light chain is elevated in the serum of patients with uh, MS against control, and the elevation, the degree of elevation correlates with the degree of disease activity as measured by MRI. My presentation about the EAN Ectrim's uh, guideline on pharmacological management of multiple sclerosis, uh, we presented the, 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 the global aim and overview of the, of the guideline, the guideline scope and the guideline methodology that was followed, both going into the specific flow chart that was followed, uh, the one issued by the uh, European Academy of Neurology for proposing planning and uh, writing neurological management guidelines, but also the specific 
scientific methodology that was used to review the, the evidence, which is the GRADE methodology. Uh, we also gave some detail on the topics that were covered uh, in the different uh, guideline questions, a total of 10 questions, and uh, a taste of uh, some of the recommendations that will be included in the guideline. This has been a, a, a very, very successful meeting. I think we had a record of participants, more than 9,000 participants in this, in this Congress. Neurologists, but also nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists, many, many professionals. So thank you very much to all these people. And uh, of course, ne next year in Paris, 2017, I hope to have even a more successful meeting. So please come to Paris 2017.